Thanks a lot to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak here about our experiment regarding mixtures of ytterbium rubidium atoms. Uh, during the nice talks that we had today of Francesca and uh, Martin about the recent great results in their experiments, I'm a little bit humble about our experiment, but I still hope that we uh, that I can add something to the cold molecules and I'll try to convince you in the next, whatever, 35 minutes, uh, that ytterbium rubidium is an interesting system and uh, that we are <coughs> hopefully on the way towards ultra-cold molecules. Um, I will first give you an introduction about the system, a short one, then tell you something about interactions between <coughs> ytterbium and rubidium in a conservative trap before I move on to our recent experiments on photoassociation spectroscopy. And in the end, and that's also kind of an outlook, I will talk about the prospects for Feshbach resonances in this particular system. So the ytterbium rubidium system um, can be seen as a mixture. And the special thing about it is that we have here a mixture of a paramagnetic atom, namely rubidium, and a diamagnetic atom, namely ytterbium. And uh, until the experiments I'll show you today uh, the, the interactions between these two atoms were completely unexplored. And uh, the nice thing about having a paramagnetic and a diamagnetic atom is actually that you can in easily, independently manipulate the, the two species and uh, by this get around, for example, problems of gravitational sag or something if you want to work with a mixture. Um, there should be optical flashback resonances and that's how try to convince you, hopefully also magnetic Feshbach resonances. And with the seven stable isotopes of ytterbium, there's a lot of room to play with and to explore interactions, even if you cannot tune them with the Feshbach resonance. As a molecule, um, the, the crown, you will have a heteronuclear molecule, of course. And um, the ground state is special as compared to the alkali, bialkali systems. It's a doublet sigma uh, ground state. And this means there is, a, um, there is a magnetic dipole moment as well as the usual electric dipole moment that everybody's talking about. And so this might be, and I will not go into detail here, might be a nice toolbox for, uh, for lattice spin models um, since we have the spin in the absolute ground state uh, of, the, of the system. Uh, the properties of the rubidium mixture can be, can be quite ver uh, variable. And we have here for rubidium-87, which is the species of the rubidium isotope we've been using so far mostly, and, uh, and bosons, and then the bosonic isotopes of ytterbium, we already would have five different fictitious scattering lengths. And if we add the fermions, we get actually two more. And if you look at it in a way that you plot fictitious scattering length against the mass. This looks a lot like a Feshbach resonance, even though you, you cannot really tune the mass. Uh, it's, 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 tuned, it's tuned by nature, but, but in the end, as I will show you later, this will look um, completely the same. So there's a wide range of interaction properties expected, and as I will show you, they're, they have also been observed partly. The molecule, as I told you, will have a magnetic and an electric dipole moment, and until we started this Experiment. Actually, we had no idea about the molecule at all because there were no experiments on even hot ytterbium rubidium molecules and there were no calculations. But a group then situated also at the University of Düsseldorf started to do some ab initio calculations and the important first outcome is there is a bound ground state and it's, it's not incredibly deep but it's got a depth of around 1000 base numbers. And uh, the electric dipole moment is around a device. So it's a reasonable, it's not potassium sodium, but it's a reasonable um, electric dipole moment that's going to be expected. So this is really a dipole molecule if we get there. So if we now look at the interactions in a, in a conservative trap, um, then as I've already told you, the special thing about the terbium rubidium is that we can make practically independent traps, have an independent manipulation of the two species, and the whole thing is built out of a well-known cloverleaf magnetic trap for rubidium and a bichromatic trap for, for ytterbium. And the idea is that the ytterbium is trapped in a dipole trap while the rubidium is trapped in a magnetic trap and it's easy to move either one of the two, even easier to move the magnetic trap. So we can 
prepare them at separate places, move them together, and as you will see, this is important for our experiment. And the idea about the optical trap is that in order to have a trap that's not being seen by the, uh, by the rubidium and only by the terbium, we use a bichromatic optical trap where the light shifts cancel for the rubidium and they add up for the terbium. And if you then look more closely at the spatial distribution of even a perfect Gaussian beam, then you find that the cancellation for rubidium is only happening at a small region in space around the minimum, around the minimum of, the, of the trap, but that's as you will see, good enough for, for our experiments. <laughs> so um, the first thing we, we, of course, did was look at the interactions. And the way we did it is we prepare the terbium in our bio DT at temperatures of around 5 microkelvin. We prepare the rubidium in a magnetic trap located approximately a millimeter or 500 microliters away. And then we move the two on top of each other, and we have a Define spatial overlap between terbium and rubidium, and for the uh, for the purpose of looking at the interactions, we have a defined start of the interactions, namely when the two come on top of each other. So this we did for several terbium isotopes, and uh, here we have the isotopes um, 170, 172, 173, and 176, and you see already that there is a strong isotope dependence, you mainly see it on the scale of the x-axis, which is, which is the time, and the black dots are, uh, is the temperature of the, of the ytterbium cloud, while the red dots are the temperature of the rubidium cloud, and the blue dots, for reference, is ytterbium without rubidium present, so we see a nice thermalization, and we would regard this as a normal behavior. It's different for different, uh, for different isotopes, but that's what you expect. So uh, you can try to do a quantitative analysis, and you just look at the thermalization rate and can calculate an overlap integral and uh, and get the, the scattering ytterbium rubidium scattering cross section out of this. But then we see that we have a problem. The trap is you don't have the perfect cancellation of the optical trap. So we are, even if it's perfectly Gaussian, we have residual little humps here in the potential. Since the trap is never perfectly Gaussian, even that is not true. So what we can do is, it's very hard to control the the overlap integral of the density um, very well. Actually, this can vary easily by an order of magnitude. But for the different isotopes, if we prepare them all in the same way, we can we can get out relative values for for the scattering cross section. Um, I'll come to that later. But now to the other isotopes. Um, if we now go to 174 ytterbium, with our experiment, we were not even to able to observe thermalization uh, rate because for technical reasons, it takes about 20 milliseconds until we can take any decent data point. And at that time, um, the ytterbium 174 was already thermalized with the rubidium, essentially, no matter what we did. And so this means there must be an extremely large elastic cross-section. And... Uh, we would call this an extraordinary behavior. And the extraordinary about it will come in a minute again. Um, if we now look for 170 ytterbium, it does exactly the opposite. We can wait for not ages, but for seconds uh, and see no thermalization whatsoever under the exact same conditions as for the other isotopes. And uh, this means there's an extremely small elastic scattering cross section for this isotope. And also, this is maybe an extraordinary behavior. Uh, what we can then do is try to increase the rubidium density by changing our optical trap a little bit, and then we get some little bit of thermalization, and in this, uh, um, under these circumstances, it's much easier to control the, the density of the, of the rubidium, and we can deduce the scattering length on the order of 10 a naught, and as you will see, probably it's even, it's even smaller. So now what we've now done is we've changed, <coughs> our, we've changed our trap from being an optical trap that is sort of compensated for the, for the rubidium to a trap that the rubidium is also trapped in an optical trap. And as you know, the density increases. And now we want to look what happens with ytterbium with 174 under these circumstances. And uh, in the first 
case that we had before, we have some thermalization. And now what happens if we increase the rubidium density? The first thing that happens is we have large losses uh, due to three body, probably three body processes. So we lose our ethereum under these circumstances, but we've never seen any, any losses under other circumstances. And the other thing is, we can not only look at the number of atoms, but we can look at the distribution of atoms in our trap. And if we now do this, and what we do here is, we have here rubidium and ethereum both imaged in the trap. The ethereum is absorption imaging, and the, the rubidium is a, is a dark contrast imaging. If we increase the rubidium density, then what you see is, uh, you see a hole in the ethereum distribution coming up. And note, this is not in the this is not in the quantum degenerate regime. We are just a little bit above the quantum degeneracy, and we don't reach quantum degeneracy here. Um, this is at around three microkelvin, but still the rubidium seems to push the ytterbium out of our trap, and this is a separation of the of the two species in the temperature range between 1.5 and 7 microkelvin, and uh, due to the much smaller number of ytterbium than the number of rubidium, we see no detectable effect on the rubidium. So the first and naive approach would then be, of course, to think that the rubidium is forming some kind of mean field potential for, for the ytterbium. But if you go into numbers and think more closely about it, this is not what can be the reason. This would require a scattering length on the order of 40,000 A0. And then you have disregarded everything about unitarity limited interactions if you calculate it this way. So this is not, a, this is not reasonable. So together with, a, with um, IGT Singh at, uh, uh, at Maryland, we, uh, we developed a diffusion model, or we discussed the diffusion model, which says that um, due to the large elastic cross-section, the motion of ytterbium slowed in our experiment in the presence of the rubidium in the center. Uh, the large three-body loss coefficients leads to a spatially dependent loss. So essentially, the ytterbium is eaten up, eaten up in the center of the trap. But due to the large elastic cross-section, it doesn't enter fast. So we have a relatively stable situation, which is stable on the order of 10 to 100 milliseconds. And this might explain the hole in the ytterbium, in the ytterbium distribution. And uh, this is a calculated or modeled axial density distribution which uh, gives essentially our results. I don't go into numbers here because due to the specialties of the experiments, the numbers would not be that trustworthy. But the, the, main, the main principle of the dynamics can be explained here. So the main thing is really that uh, we have a large interaction between ytterbium-174 uh, and, uh, and rubidium-87. And what you can do now is you can do you can take the values for 170, the extraordinary values, for 170 ytterbium and 174 ytterbium together with 87 rubidium, and start trying to deduce from that the uh, to deduce uh, to deduce from that um, the molecular uh, the, uh, the molecular levels in the in the ground state, and deduce all the other scattering deduce all the other scattering length, and this was also done by I. Singer and, and Steve Maxwell. And this gives you a curve that sh looks a lot like uh, the Feshbach resonance curve, quote unquote, that I've, uh, that I've told you before. And um, this explains nicely then the variation in the thermalization rate of the normally behaving isotopes. So if you take the unusual isotopes and the normally behaving isotopes are nicely explained. There is, due to the unprecise knowledge of this, in particular of this, zero in the scattering length around one, 170. There is some, uh, some room for, for precision, but as you will see, photoassociation spectroscopy will help us really to, to resolve this problem. So um, we can explain these, these scattering properties, and then we want to go on to really for molecules, and we started with that, um, forming molecules that are actually hot and excited. So we are doing photosociation spectroscopy, and the first step to do it is to do it in a, in a, in a, with, a with only one photon. So you go from the ground state where you have two free atoms to an excited state, uh, 
area of an excited state molecule living for a couple of ten nanoseconds, but that's, that's fine for the moment. It's, it's still a molecule. And but from that, you can at least, or you can start to learn something about the energy levels of the excited state molecule here. And the experimental procedure to do this is now go back one step. We don't go into a conservative trap at micro Kelvin temperatures or even below. We do it in a double species continuously loaded mod. We have a green mod of ytterbium with around 10 to the six, six atoms. We have a rubidium dark spot mod with around 10 to the nine atoms loaded at the same place. Um, you shine in a photo association laser with a variable frequency and look at the loss induced by this photo association laser as a function of the frequency. And if you only lose rubidium, then it's rubidium 2 formation. And if we lose ytterbium, then it must be ytterbium rubidium formation because the, the photo association laser is tuned close to an atomic transition of rubidium. So if you look, you look at, the, at the number of ytterbium atoms in steady state in our mod, as a function of the frequency of this PA laser. And this is what, what you can observe. If you tune the laser over yeah, several wave numbers, you went down to 30, to 30 wave numbers, you say, see distinct places where actually the number of terbium atoms is going down significantly. And these places um, can be attributed to hitting a resonance to an excited state molecular level. And just to show you what's the difference between homonuclear and heteronuclear photo association, this is the same graph that you've just seen for, in this case, the terbium 176, 87 rubidium. And this is the same graph over essentially the same span for uh, rubidium, rubidium. Um, this tells you, since you have much more, much more levels here in the rubidium, rubidium potential, that the heteronuclear excited states are more tightly bound than the homonuclear excited states. And the important thing for our experiments will be to stay away from anything that's only related to, only related to the rubidium, but to look for, look for the places where you can find nice uh, terpen rubidium resonances. So now we can tune more closely into one of these terpen lines. And the first thing you observe is a hyperfine splitting which is, since it's very large molecules, it's essentially the hyperfine splitting of the rubidium atom in the, in the excited state. Then you also see in the rotational splitting, um, we are at temperatures well above the, uh, well, um, well above the P-wave threshold. So um, we, we can actually excite higher line rotations up to three here in this, in this case. And if you even look more closely into it, then you see something that we didn't understand at first. The rotational lines seem to or split up into several, uh, into several components. And the, the more deeply bound the excited state is, the larger the spacing here is. And this can be explained by a coupling of the total angular momentum of the molecule or the rubidium atom, because the terbium doesn't have an angular momentum. Uh, to the nuclear to the nuclear rotation, and this gives rise to a splitting of the uh, of the rotational levels, which I won't, don't want to go into more detail. But you we will encounter it later on, again. So um, if we now take all our knowledge about all our uh, about all the levels in the excited state, uh, then we can start modeling the the potential. And for doing this, we use the so-called Leroy Bernstein. For the, in the use Leroy Bernstein formula, which has been produced by, by Leroy and, and Bernstein, to assign first the quantum number, the vibrational quantum numbers to the excited states, <coughs> um, taking into account the, the binding energies we've measured by just measuring the difference of um, the frequency of the photo association laser and. Um, the resonance uh, transition in the rubidium atom. And if this assumes that you have a C6, uh, that you have a C6 potential. And uh, in this case here, what you can see here is the black dots are this um, ytterbium 176, rubidium 87, and the white dots are ytterbium 174, 87 rubidium. This just shows you that the electronic potential is the same independent of the isotope. 
and essentially what you have here is a mass scaling that enters here in the this enters here in the reduced mass in the formula, and so for different isotopic combinations, they fit nicely together. And the C6 coefficient for this excited state is around 6,000. 6, so this tells us we know what you do in photoassociation spectroscopy, but now these are not the molecules that we want. We don't want the molecules in the excited state, of course we want molecules in the ground state, and even though it might be difficult <coughs> to do photoassociation, Photo association will tell you a lot about the ground state of the molecules if you do it with two photons instead of one photon. And in order to do this, we have one laser, which is the photo association laser that you already know, and a second probe laser. And if we take the frequency difference of the photo association laser and the probe laser, then we essentially get the binding energy of the ground state. If the lasers are adjusted such, that the probe laser is in resonance with the molecular transition. You also have to take into account that there's hyperfine in the ground state, but that's a easy, easily corrected. And one thing that should be noted, but I don't want to go into more, much more detail here, if you have these large molecules, uh, then essentially the probe laser only couples to transitions where the rotational quantum number does not, uh, does not change. <coughs> so how do we do this in the experiment? The, we set our photo association laser to a single photon resonance so that we know we create excited state molecules. And this gives you, us a continuous trap loss. And then we shine in the probe laser. And once the probe laser hits a molecular transition, we reduce the trap loss because the probe laser essentially, essentially exerts a light shift on the uh, on the excited state <coughs> and shifts the photo association lasers out of resonance. And from the frequency of the probe laser, we can thus deduce the binding energy of the ground state. So we use two different single photon, single photon photo association resonances just to make sure that we should measure the same binding energies no matter what excited state we use. So if you use two and it's really the same, then you know that what you observe is, is correct. And now we fix the PA laser, <coughs> scan the probe laser, and what we observe is this here, over a range now of, of one wave number. We observe quite a few transitions, quite a few places where, depending on the frequency of the probe laser, the for the, the molecule production rate, the production rate of excited state <coughs> molecules is <coughs> reduced. And what I give here is, and that we will be able to deduce it by the same way we did before, we're using the Leroy Bernstein formalism, is the vibrational quantum number of, of the ground state associated with the molecular transition. <coughs> and here the red and black numbers mean that we also observe transitions between different ground states here, namely, um, namely ground states which belong, to, uh, which belong to different hyperfine levels of rubidium, namely the F equals 1 and F equals 2 state. And we see here always a pair which is just separated by the hyperfine splitting of the, uh, of the rubidium ground state. And we also see some things that we would not want to see. B and A are just technical features which don't have to do with molecular physics. So. We can do exactly the same that we've done for, for the excited state. We can use the Leroy Bernstein fitting algorithm. And again, assuming a C6 potential for, uh, for the ground state, we derive a C6 coefficient of around 2,500 to 2,600, which agrees pretty well with the theoretical, calcu the theoretical calculations for our, uh, for our ground state levels. And should be noted here, that in this graph, we have actually, we have actually data from the two different excited intermediate states um, put together in, in, one, uh, in one graph, and also data from the different hyperfine components where we've just, where we've just subtracted the hyperfine energy from the, uh, from the difference of the, of the two photo association laser energies. Then we went on just to see how does, it, does the whole picture fit, to look for two-photon-photon association spectroscopy 
in other isotopes. So overall, we looked at four, at all the four bosonic isotopes of ytterbium, and uh, or not all, four of the five, and uh, and 87 rubidium. We just didn't use the fermions because there the structure is more complicated. You have you have a nuclear spin there, and you see that also here they fit nicely on the curve that we've we've calculated for uh, that we've calculated for 176 ytterbium. And the only thing that has to be adjusted is this little, uh, this little fractional quantum number, Vd, that, that uh, turns out as a parameter in the Leroy Bernstein fit in order to adjust for all the isotopic combinations. And what you see here is that we only look at the, at the very high-lying levels. And for these, we can, actually, we can actually measure the binding energies the inaccuracy of around 10 megahertz, which is mostly from fitting, from fitting the lines. And uh, we see here a nice agreement. This is just the residuals that we, uh, that we get here. So we have everything very well, under, very well under control. And now we can go on doing what I promised you before, taking these data and looking, uh, and looking whether they agree with the scattering cross-sections that we did that we derived from thermalization. And uh, we've done some preliminary analysis here. We use a semi-classical approximation now, also using a C12 coefficient. And um, the scattering length is, uh, is then given in terms of some average scattering length and a, and a phase factor. And uh, the phase essentially only depends on the C6 and the C12 coefficient. We don't use the Leroy Bernstein formalism, which in principle, if you just just are naive, has also two parameters, but it uh, but, uh, but the Leroy Bernstein formalism fails very close uh, to the dissociation limit, and therefore it's not very good to, uh, to derive the, the scattering length. But um, if we now use this and solve the Schrödinger equation numerically, we take the C6 coefficient that we already know and just adjust the C12, the C12 coefficient uh, to match the, the binding energies, then we can derive the phase. And we derive first the C12 coefficient from, of 2.74 times 10 to the 8. And from that, we can actually use the scattering length. And you see that we have a pretty good agreement with what we have seen before. For 170 ytterbium, it's around 5 A0. For 174, it says 1,400 uh, A0. But this is still preliminary because we haven't varied the C6 here. We just took the C6 from the Leo Bernstein uh, formalism. And this has, we have to go into more detail here. But these results are very promising. Everything fits. The whole picture is, the whole picture is nice. Now the next thing we, we, we did is we, we thought, I mean, if you do, do photon spectroscopy, then you better look also for outer towns, uh, for outer town splitting. So what is an outer town splitting? Um, if you have a laser which is coupling two molecular levels and you increase the intensity of, uh, of that laser, then this gives rise to a splitting of the, of the excited state. And this splitting is related to the Rabi frequency, which also includes the Frank Conton factor for the molecular for the molecular transition. Um, so if you now use the second laser, the PA laser as the probe, while the probe laser is, is fixed, uh, then you can observe the Rabi splitting in a spectrum of the PA laser. And just remember the one photon PA spectrum that we had before. What we now do is we put the coupling laser from the ground state delta V equals minus 6 to the excited state delta V prime equals minus 11 and a particular rotational subcomponent. And what you then see is that this level splits up. You see a nice, you see a nice out of town splitting. And we can also put ourselves on another subcomponent. And another subcomponent splits up here in the, in the excited state. <coughs> and that's only, not only nice physics but you can also use it for something. And you can namely, you can use it, uh, or you can first see whether everything is fine. You vary the power and look at the splitting as a function of power, detuned and not detuned. Uh, you vary the detuning at a, at a given power and, and look at the splitting 
and so you can reproduce these, these formulas. And then you can use the splitting as a measure of actually the frank quantum factor. And we did this for the delta V equals minus 6 delta V prime equals minus 11 um, transition. And uh, from that you can deduce for this particular transition a frank quantum factor from of almost 0.3. And for a corresponding transition in, in the other excited stable level of 0.37. So this tells us that if you are in the excited state, minus 9, then most of the population actually falls down to one ground state level. Maybe we'll make of use of that in the, in the future. But uh, for now, this is just a nice way to measure the frank quantum factors. The relative frank quantum factors here, again, are pretty good. For the absolute numbers, we, we have the problem that it's hard to know the density that really the, uh, the intensity that the atoms really see, which has to go into, into a quantitative analysis of this here. But this is, already, this is already showing us that this method works pretty well. So the last thing, or actually the outlook I want to I want to talk about is if you put all the knowledge together that we have, and from the two photon spectroscopy, we actually know the binding energies of the ground state. If you know the binding energies of the ground state, then it should be straightforward to calculate the positions of Feshbach resonances. And so let's see. Feshbach resonances could happen. I mean, here, this would be the potentials that we have, the rubidium F equals 1, F, F equals minus 1, plus 174 ytterbium, and the F equals 2, M F equals minus 1. The problem is that we, we can surely shift the potentials with the magnetic field with respect to each other. The question is, is, is there a coupling? I mean, the, that's the main question because the, the ytterbium doesn't have any angular momentum, and so essentially the state stays, keeps mainly its character of the, of the rubidium F equals 2 and F equals 1. But there was a hopefully nice paper, or two nice theory papers in the last year of uh, Jerry Mehatzma and uh, collaborators for similar systems like for, for strontium rubidium. The nice thing about calculating the Feshbach resonances, <laughs> if you know the binding energies, is that's very simple. You just use bright Rabi formula for the states of rubidium and add the binding energies. And then you look at the crossings and you identify all the positions of Feshbach resonances here. And that's what Jeremy and Piotr Tsukowski had calculated. Uh, in the case of rubidium strontium, which is a very, which is a similar, which is a similar case, um, they had calculated not knowing the binding energies of the ground state. They just had assumed something. And they had calculated that the widths are not enormous. They are not gauss. They are milligauss. But they are in a range where they might be usable. Think of the experiments in rubidium 87. Um, where resonances of a, of a similar width are actually successfully used to make Feshbach molecules in, in, rubidium, in rubidium 87. So it's certainly not in vain to look for that also in, in our system. So we do the same. We use, we use bright Rabi formula, add our known or calculated binding energies, and do this for 174 ytterbium 87 rubidium, and the first resonance we find is at 2,000 Gauss. Uh, this is the open channel, the closed channel, and for the bosonic ytterbium, only delta MF equals zero resonances are allowed. Then we look for the next isotope, 172 ytterbium 87 rubidium. Uh, it's a little bit lower, it's 1,600 Gauss or something. Uh, and this is really the lowest, red. there is no other crossing. And for all the bosonic isotopes, the lowest one is 168 ytterbium. I mean, this is uh, it's really embarrassing hearing this morning, the, or also now from, from potassium sodium, where you have resonances in the Gauss range. Uh, and 168 ytterbium is really not the most abundant isotope. Uh, so maybe this is not, maybe this is not, uh, we can make, we can actually, we could actually go here. But, uh, Fine, so let's look at the fermions, which might even be more interesting. Uh, for fermionic isotopes, there should be also resonances delta mf equals zero and plus minus one. They might be even narrower, or they are probably narrow, as also Hudson and collaborators have, have calculated. But also there, for 87 rubidium, the lowest lying resonance is at 1,200 Gauss. Um, and for the other isotope, it's, it's even higher. Um, 
you know, <coughs> that's not very promising. We might have one or two resonances with all the isotopes of ytterbium that we could access with 87 rubidium. But we have also 85 rubidium, and we, we can, from our data, we can easily calculate the resonance for 85 rubidium. And that looks much more promising. If we take 172 ytterbium and 85 rubidium, we have a resonance here at around 400 gauss. And it turns out that what, what Jeremy has calculated is that um, if you have a situation like this where you have where the two states cross twice, then the second one of these resonances is typically pretty wide, uh, relatively wide, which means maybe 100 milligrams. <coughs> uh, and uh, so the lowest resonances of 85 rubidium are actually now in a very accessible in a very accessible range, and we can switch between the isotopes between the isotopes easily. And if we add the fermionic isotopes, um, then we see that at least for f for five isotopes in a very reasonable very reasonable range. So we've set out to look for the Feshbach resonances with 85 rubidium and and ytterbium. We have seen the 85 rubidium resonances uh, <laughs> alone, um, and we're now. We're now going to hunt for the resonances where we, don't, where we don't know the widths, but we can see rubidium resonances easily in 87 <coughs> rubidium, which have a similar widths. So at least first to identify that they might be there, this would be a good road. So thanks for your attention. Right, thank you. Next slide. So there's uh, time for a few questions. Uh, I was just curious, um, what splits the, um, the de degeneracy between the first and the second? Is, is, is there a s simple picture why the second one should be broader? You said the second one uh, of these two, <coughs> of, of these two pairs. Resonance. I mean, it's clear that in this case, the, the, the that we will have a broad resonance because we will have a very... The for, for, the for both, yeah. The slope is, is, pretty, uh, uh. is pretty low. But I don't really know what splits, the, what splits it between the first mm -hmm. and so the nicest thing would be if they just touch. There's one, there's one case where they might touch. I mean, I have to say, I believe that our values are good to probably within 10, 10 gauss. I mean, this is sort of the accuracy that we already have. Okay. Uh, welcome. Where do you think? Here's the... Actually, elaborating on the question of broad Feshbach resonances, the Feshbach resonance is broad if there is... Uh, a, an intersection between the molecular and the atomic energy curve at very shallow angle. But this is not, of course, increasing the matrix element, the energetic matrix element. And in most of the situations I've encountered for the physics we want to do, it is only uh, the matrix element, which is, so to speak, the Rabi frequency between atoms and molecules. This is sort of deciding how quickly we, we can go from atoms into molecules and whether it's a broad or narrow Feshbach resonance in the end. The slope only helps in terms of magnetic field stabilization, which could be an important experimentally. This is the first thing we, we thought about, is, is experimentally have the magnetic field stabi stability at all that we, that we need for these resonances, because it requires 10 to minus 5 to 10 to minus 6 and, and the lower fields here, this looks nice. Okay. At the 1,200 Gauss, this, this would be, it's hard, I mean, it's doable, but hard. Okay, further questions? Yes, please, wait a second. A number of slides ago, you showed the difference between photo association spectroscopy for uh, for uh, the heteronuclear yeah. case and the homonuclear case, and you said the homonuclear case is a lot denser compared to the heteronuclear case because um, the heteronuclear case is more deeply bound. Is that an accident, uh, or is there is that a consistent difference between? I guess this is a, just a rule of thumb. For the heteronuclear case, you have a C6, while for the homonuclear case, you have a C3 potential. Okay, so it's, and it's the heteronuclear case that's more deep. The heteronuclear case has, has a tighter potential, and thus a larger spacing of the vibrational levels. And mm -hmm. that's what we see the spacing of the vibrational levels. Right. And if the, the potential is more tightly bound, then the spacing is larger. 
Mm -hmm. That's that's what we. I mean, that's not only we. We just see it in our experiment. Okay, that makes sense. Thanks. <coughs> okay, perhaps one more question. Want to do it again? Sure. And uh, uh, just wondering about the Frank Condon factors. Uh, is it true that once once we know the uh, binding energy of the uh, two potential, the ground state and the excited state, we can in principle propagate the the Schrödinger equation, have an idea of how the wave function looks like. Maybe not at the inner core. Let's say that's not so much, but maybe we can get an idea of the overlap matrix element and compare that to the experiment. Yes, yes exactly. That, I mean, we don't only need to. Oh. We don't only need to know the binding energies. What we what we need to know from from our calculations is essentially how many how many bound levels are supported by a potential, because that tells you how many nodes you have in the how many nodes you have in the potential. And that actually comes out of the of this this calculation I showed you. So we are we have about 65 bound states, and from that we if we do it for the ground and excited state, then we can actually calculate Frank Condon factors, and they agree reasonably well with what with what we measure. Okay, if there are no urgent further questions, let's thank Axel again. Thank you. <laughs>